Well, hi, this is Robert Cahoon on the Catholic Pulse website. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm really blessed and honoured and privileged to be interviewing a very special person today. Um, I'm personally a huge fan, and this is a transatlantic interview. Um, it's currently 9pm in, in the UK, but 4pm uh, over in New York. I have Daniel O'Connor with me, and uh, Daniel has written two absolutely incredible books, The Crown of History and The Crown of Sanctity. I'll just read his bio quickly um, from, from his website. Um, he is a teacher over in the United States uh, at the university level, um, and he describes himself on, on his website. Uh, my name is Daniel Connor. In order of importance, he is a sinful and unworthy servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, a loving child and willing consecrated slave of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a loyal son of the Roman Catholic Church, husband of his amazing wife, uh, Regina, the father of four children, uh, David, Joseph, Mary and Louisa, by her and God willing, many more to come, a worker of many apostolates, um, especially promoting divine will and divine mercy, and a philosophy professor at State University of New York Community College, holding an MA in theology and studying for a PhD in philosophy, might, might have completed that by now. Daniel, how, how are you today? And thank you so much uh, for joining me. Very well. Thank you so much for having me on, Robert. And I hope you don't mind me saying it's it's an honor to be here because uh, if I've inspired you, well, you've inspired me as well. In the beginning of my early days reawakening to the faith, I, uh, 40 Days for Life was really big for me, praying and sidewalk counseling outside of Planned Parenthood. And um, 40 Days for Life, I was participating in that many years ago. And thank you so much for all you and the rest of the 40 Days for Life team have done and keep up the good work. It's amazing. That's Fantastic. So and thank you so much, Daniel. And I, I know you're part of the 40 Days campaign in, in uh, New York uh, in the past as well, and have watched your video on that on that too. But if you could just give us a kind of introduction to yourself, kind of family upbringing. Um, mm -hmm. Have you finished your PhD now or, or are you still studying? I am still working on it. I've, I'm, uh, I'm going <laughs> to be starting my fourth year soon. So a couple hundred more years and I'll have my PhD. <laughs> And they've been notorious to actually finish, finish studying yeah, PhDs. They just uh... it goes on and on. It's slow going, but um, yeah, I'm glad I'm doing it. It's it's. I believe God called me to it. Uh, you know, in fact, I was um I was at an Easter vigil mass several years ago, and I think I was I was inspired by God at that mass to work to go on for my PhD. I was already at that point already had my master's and was already teaching philosophy at the college level, but. Um, I was inspired at that point to, to go forward in my studies for the PhD because of how few people were coming into the church. There were only one or two converts coming in, and this was the cathedral of a significant diocese. And I was thinking to myself, I need to do everything I can to try and bring more people into the faith. And philosophy is evangelization. It really is. At least it can be used as that. It's not, it's not, always, it's not often used as that, but it can be because you... You use the premise to really evangelize anyone. You have to use the premises that they already hold. You, know, you can't just tell them something that they don't believe and expect them to believe it. You need to start from where, from what they already believe and work with them, build and build and build. St. Paul did this also. In fact, in, in, Greek, in Greece, to the philosophers there. And dialogue with them using that common ground. And then you can, with reason, show them the truth of the faith. I can't tell you how many students I've had who... Uh, said after taking my class, just with going through me through Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Aquinas, just going through the philosophy of these thinkers, that from that alone, they realized, oh, yeah, I do have to believe in God and the soul and the afterlife and morality. Philosophy can do that. So that, that's what inspired me to, uh, to continue my studies there. Um, so I'm working on that. I'm in my fifth year teaching philosophy. And um, I introduced myself to you could long story short, I'm just a knucklehead from New York. That's that's really all, <laughs> all all I am. I'm not I'm not anyone important, but I do know that God has asked me to promote the divine will. And I consider myself I've been studying this for a decade or so now, but I still consider myself a newbie in this because I am. And my job is just to invite other people into it, introduce other people to it. And as soon as you're introduced, you'll quickly get much higher than me in the divine world. <laughs> you you really will. Well, um, that's so. That's that's me in a nutshell. You you already uh, read the bio there about my family. So thanks be to God. Robert and I both have four kids, ages seven and under. So pray for us as our our oldest are, are you know at the age of reason now, ready for first communion and such. Well, um, I certainly philosophy was a big factor that brought me into the Catholic Church. And I, I read Fides and Ratio when I was 17 mm. years old, and 
just the importance of faith, uh, of philosophy, you know, Anselm, faith seeking understanding, and just reading John Paul's work, Faith and Reason, you know, truth and uh, truth and freedom either go in hand in hand or they perish in misery. And he just went through all the you know, history of philosophy in that document, rationalism, mm -hmm. you know, the skepticism, materialism, Marxism, just all the philosophical philosophy development throughout you know recent recent centuries and just you know for me that made christianity intellectually credible and i think you know many people do need to go through that journey you know not only to discover what faith is but you know to think to have right thinking with with so many false philosophies in our age you know this is foundational foundational starting point and i was at seminary did two years philosophy there as well so I can certainly see how how important philosophy is, and 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 how do you find teaching in um, teaching a, a state university? So you, you're teaching philosophy uh, day in day out, day out. It's got to be great to keep the the brain cogs uh, well mm. well gelled. Um, <laughs> Um, how, how long have you been teaching at the, at the philosophy level? At yeah, University it's the lion. It's a, yeah. So it's, I'm at a secular public New York college, which doesn't exactly sound like heaven on earth and, and is not, but, but I love it there because again, it's, it's, that's what I believe philosophy is best suited for evangelization. It's got other uses as well, but that's where you can proclaim the faith subtly using reason and the great thing is that nobody knows about Aristotle and, and Plato and, and Socrates anymore. They don't realize that they're being evangelized by being shown the truths contained in these ancient Greeks because the Christianity is subtle, not explicit, and it's a perfect lead-in. In fact, the, many fathers of the church saw that as divinely orchestrated, that the ancient Greek philosophers flourished, especially a few hundred years before Christianity, as kind of a, a reason-based preparation for the faith. It really is that. So I've been there. I'm in my fifth year now. And God only knows what the future holds, but um, I love it. And that's a, yeah, that's another thing we have in common. We both were in seminary for a time. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of similarities here. So, uh, yeah. so Dan, tell me about the two books that you've written. Um, we've referred to them beforehand as the small book and the big book. <laughs> yes. um, so the crown of history and the crown of sanctity. And the, the, the big one is definitely a, a very good door door stopper in, in the size of it but I've, I've really been inspired by listening to that as an audiobook which you can uh, which you very graciously given as, as free but the the crown of sanctity I, I loved going through just the history of salvation history the teachings of the saints and then showing how the divine will correlate and is in in tune with the church's teaching you know across the board from um across the board you know holy spirit teaching uniting our will with the will of God through through all the teaching of the saints and you know that was just really a mind-blowing book for me and you know and also I love the bit at the beginning of the crown of sanctity where you where you give a sort of 101 sort of Catholicism 101 so you know just to get you up to speed if you mm -hmm. if, you know depending on wherever you are it's just you know here's a one-on-one -on -one and kind of everything you need to know and it's like and then right let's go into the deep stuff yeah. so um, which is I really felt like I had to start from grounds from, from <laughs> yeah. the bedrock with that book. Which, which is your favorite book? And just give us a kind of brief summary of both books. Oh man, it's like my it's like <laughs> choosing my favorite child. Uh, uh, that that's that's sick. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't yeah. think of my books as my children. They're not. But uh, <laughs> but just to prove that one's big and one's small. Let's see. So the the big book, the small book. <laughs> as as you can see, yeah, this will kill someone if it lands on them. This <laughs> you'll be fine. Uh, I wrote the big book, The Crown of Sanctity first and i really wanted to as robert was was talking about build this from the ground up and show for i wanted to start from quite literally the ground uh, figuratively the ground up because i wanted i wanted an atheist to be able to pick up that book and be convinced of god i wanted a non-christian to be able to pick up that book and be convinced of our lord jesus christ i wanted a non-catholic to be able to pick it up and to be convinced of the holy faith so uh, that's one of the reasons why it's so big. I did a lot of, I spent a lot of time doing that in the first part of it. But then, as Robert was also saying, I wanted to show that this revelation, this private revelation on living in the divine will, it's in perfect, it's new in a sense, but it's also in perfect harmony with how the Holy Spirit has led the church for 2000 years. That's how legitimate, divinely orchestrated movements work. They're organic. They're, they're not, they're, they're, they, they, uh, they're, they work with a hermeneutic of continuity, in other words, not a hermeneutic of rupture, as Pope Benedict XVI differentiated between there. And we can see if we really look at the greatest movements of the Holy Spirit in the spiritual theology of the church for 2000 years, I believe we can conclusively 
and clearly see this divine will spirituality being prepared for for 2000 years. So I wanted to uh, that, that's another reason this is so big. I wanted to include a lot of quotes from saints and mystics before Louisa to, to show that Louisa's revelations, G Jesus's private revelations to Louisa, which is what I mean when I say that, are in perfect harmony with all that, even though, of course, they're, they're, they're new and they go beyond. So I wrote that first, and then uh, understandably, I got people saying, well, that's too long. And I uh, compressed the gist of it as much as I possibly could into a vastly smaller package. So in terms of my favorite, I mean, you might as well start with something smaller because I also reference throughout the pages of this book where you can go to in a bigger book to get more information. So I suppose there's no reason not to start with the smaller one. And then if you have time, you can go on to the bigger one. But the smaller one at least will still introduce you to Jesus's revelations to Louisa. And I know the titles don't specific, well, the subtitle of the big one does speak of Jesus's words to Louisa. Both of these books, rest assured, are primarily about Jesus's revelation to Louisa. I wanted the smaller book to have as broad appeal as possible, but my goal with that small book was to just get it out to as many people as possible, which is why I wanted to make it as small as I could, but I also wanted to uh, use a title and subtitle that would be as attractive as possible to as many people as possible. I think more people will probably relate to the notion of history reaching its culmination than uh, sanctity reaching its culmination, even though sanctity is more important, but still, I, my hope is that this can uh, relate to as many people as possible. And um, for some people, I mean, in the large book, The Crown of Sanctity, you talk about the importance of private revelation and what private revelation is. So some Catholics are going to be thinking, you know, where does private revelation fit into our faith? And you, you really clearly describe the importance of private revelation. We get the rosary from private revelation. And so some Catholics might be afraid of private revelation thinking, you know, is this some crazy speaking? It's not, has it been authenticated by the church, etc. cetera? Um, you know, can you kind of tell us why private re revelation is important for us? And, you know, what does it have, what context does it have in the spiritual lives for Catholics? Yeah, it's, it's such a misunderstood topic today. Yeah. There's, there's not been good catechesis on this. And uh, you see extreme opposites. Uh, uh, with this with this question, and we need to understand the happy medium here. So it's private revelation. So it's not public revelation. It's not the deposit of faith, which simply means it's not a new foundation for our faith. The foundation for the faith is sealed and permanent and completed. It's scripture, sacred traditions, understanding of scripture, the magisterium's interpretation of that foundation. That can't be added to. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that's all that's important. I mean, the, the, the greatest things that God is going to do moving forward throughout the history of the church, in fact, and moving forward is going to be his continued direct interventions. You know, we're not cessationalist heretics. That's a common in a few Protestant circles where basically the Holy Spirit stopped really acting after the times of the apostles. So that, that's a heresy. But the Holy Spirit is as active as ever. In fact, he, he just becomes more and more active as time goes on because as history approaches its culmination. So although we, you know, we needed public revelation to be completed after a certain amount of time, because we, it was so important that we don't remain continually wondering what the essence of the faith is. We are, we are absolutely certain in the essence of the faith. It's like the foundation of a building. We have it. We know the confines, you know, to, to build a good building, you need to stay over that foundation. You can't go building awkwardly off in a, in a hermeneutic of rupture, as Pope Benedict would call it. But as long as we have that understanding regarding public revelation, we can safely approach private revelation. Why? Because we know we have the lens through which to interpret private revelation. We interpret private revelation through the lens of public revelation, and we, uh, we apply the objective criteria of discernment for private revelation. And look, I, I have all people understand that that's a minefield. It, it's very, it can be difficult, above all with the living seers. There's so much confusion. There, there's a lot of false prophets out there. There's a lot of false private revelations out there. And I still think it's important to, to consider seriously the living seers. But admittedly, there's a lot of room for error there. But that's not at all what we're dealing with with Louisa. We're dealing with a seer who, whose cause for canonization has been proceeding very well for decades now, who is a servant of God, who had canonized saint 
a canonized saint dedicating his life and not just any canonized saint he was he was her own spiritual director and confessor dedicating his life to promoting this by san padre pio we've got a, a vatican biography strongly endorsing her and her revelations and we, we've got the, the rigorously documented miracles and mystical phenomena and confirmed pro and uh, prophecies that were fulfilled. I could go on and on. I have examined every possible avenue through which these revelations could be false. And every one of them is a dead end. There's no possible, yes, it's private revelation. So it has no right to, to contradict public revelation. Of course not. But it is a true private revelation. And if you're not going to reject the rosary or the brown scapular or the miraculous medal or the divine mercy devotion or the sacred heart devotion, then you better not reject the divine will revelations because this revelation, it's, it's the culmination of private revelation, still a private revelation, but it is the culmination of it. I think two things that really have struck me and it was during like the, the lockdown in 2020 um, just realizing that there's so much more depth to the spiritual life. And, you know, we've talked about the kind of development of Christian doctrine. Cardinal Newman wrote a book on that as well, about, you know, our faith isn't just uh, stale, it develops over time and grows organically, as you said. And, you know, most Catholics aren't kind of thinking in terms of eras, in terms of, you know, had Judaism, had Christianity and you know, maybe there's, there's, there's more to come. And Fatima talks about an era of, era of peace. So, you know, for, for me personally, reading, reading these writings for the first time, um, it was, you know, wow, incredible discovery. There's so much more to the spiritual life. Um, so many people have a very deep interior life uh, and I'm scratching the surface of, of what's really there. And, you know, to, to really, th there are incredible teachings on private revelation and you know a lot of that wasn't even on, on my radar even up to even up to last year and you I think you've given a very credible and sound defense of private revelation there you know Louisa you know her spiritual director was uh, you know is a saint he's got a you know, statue in the Vatican a lot of her works are imprimatur she's in consideration for being a canonized saint um so there's a lot of you know there's a lot of street cred in in, in that for anyone who's worried about private revelation being private revelation being you know kind of a some, something else and, and there's so much depth to christian mysticism um you know the the mystics of the 20th century is a fascinating topic and you know uh, some of these teachings just you know they're not as well known as perhaps perhaps they they, they could be so you know, if you could just summarize, you know, what does it mean to live in the divine will and, and who was Louisa Pecoretta and what is the essence and summary of uh, her message? I know that's a, the tough job with a, with a book that's uh, big, <laughs> big enough to be a doorstop, but uh, if you can put it, a, a can weapon. you put it in a nutshell or not? I'm not sure you can. Well, but... I can try. And, yeah. and maybe the <laughs> nutshell is the most important. Be I mean, yeah. Louisa herself, first of all, she was, um, well, here's the Vatican's biography of her then. Yeah. She was, um, Oh, I got a reflection right on it. She was an Italian mystic in the 20th, 19th and 20th century who lived, I've said this before, but she lived the most boring life in history. I think that's actually true. I think she lived the most boring <laughs> life in history externally, for, as you would think from the outside. Eight, she died at 81 or 82 and uh, almost all of her life, she was bedridden. She actually, and she wasn't always taken great care of. And she was persecuted a lot also, but she went decades, I think, without anyone even thinking to wheel her outside to see, to see the sun. Uh, it's, it's amazing how, how very bland her life was in that regard. So everything was interior and hidden. She was kept lowly. She was, she was, the lowliest person you could imagine no, no standing whatsoever in the world no education no theology background no philosophy background which is by the way another proof that this is supernatural in origin uh, these are the most profound mystical writings i've ever read and i've read a lot philosophically even the the, the philosophical precision in jesus's words to louisa it blows away aristotle <laughs> there is no possible way an uneducated, bedridden laywoman could have come up with this. So, but um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm already getting, I'm, so I'm getting a bit sidetracked here. But so Louisa, you know, she, she had these decades and decades of times in a bed, bed she bedridden, couldn't get up. 
every morning she was more dependent upon the authority of clergy than anyone else in history also she couldn't even move in the morning until a priest came into her room and blessed her didn't have to be a holy priest even didn't have to be a good just just a priest would come in and bless her and her motion would be miraculously restored she still couldn't get out of bed but she could at least talk and, and read and write the pope himself gave permission for mass to be celebrated every day in her little room there she couldn't get out of it which is very rare for those permissions to be granted and it was you know the greatest grace of her life being able to receive our lord every day in the eucharist which is all she all she received she didn't need to eat and that she shares that with some other mystics who miraculously went years and years without any food um but the the that's all to confirm the message the message is what's really important here not so much the biographical details of louisa the message is exactly what saint Hannibal said I don't have the quote here with me, but he wrote it right in the introduction to the Hours of the Passion, which is one of Luisa's little books uh, going through the details of what our Lord suffered in the Passion. He said, let's see how much I can get from memory, but uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, who century after century increases his grace, has decided to deign with this lowly virgin a mission so great that nothing else can be compared to it. The coming of the kingdom of the divine will on earth in fulfillment of the Our Father prayer. And that's paraphrased because I'm going from memory, but that's, uh, that's exactly the gist. <laughs> that's the gist of what St. Hannibal said, that this lowly virgin who is nothing in the eyes of the world has been entrusted with the fulfillment of the Our Father prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I'm a big follower of private revelation in general, but my... It's important to distinguish here. My zeal for these particular revelations is not just a subset of my zeal for private revelation. This is, it's, it's a bit mysterious here. It's a private revelation, but it's, it's more than just that. It's the private revelation. It's, it's God's final, I, I'm convinced, I've said this a number of times before as well, but I'm convinced that God has two ultimate final efforts in the world. One of, one of salvation and one of sanctification. And I believe that his final effort of salvation in the world was his divine mercy revelations to St. Faustina, and that his final effort of sanctification in the world, because of the two things we always know that God wills, our salvation and our sanctification, that his final effort of sanctification is these revelations to Louisa, that we live God's will on earth just as the saints live it in heaven. And that doesn't mean this isn't millenarianism. That doesn't mean that we have the beatific vision or that we actually see our Lord face to face or that anything proper to heaven is on earth. No, it's his will being done. It's of course, God would not be good if it was impossible for his will to be done on earth as he wants it to be done, as it's done in heaven. That is what we have been working towards throughout the whole history of the church. And Jesus is telling Louise that the time has come for that to be fulfilled. The Our Father prayer is a promise and a prophecy, and now is the time for it. That's the essence of Luis's revelations. That's coming for the world, but it's also available for the asking right now, if only you want it. If only you want God's will to reign in your life, you ask for it. You give up your will and you ask for his. That's right. Well, I think you put, touched on really two really important points there and one is that louisa had no theological training uh you know i mean in short you know you don't write the sort of summer theologi if you don't have like some kind of like theology training so if you don't have a sort of further education you're not going to write something which is profound deep um you know very very orthodox you know outstanding in in the teaching if you've got a simple education you know that's a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a leap just suddenly to start writing the most yeah. incredible teaching in the world and and as you're saying you know this is really in the world of private revelation this is just you know the the best uh, sort of just the kind of the pinnacle the the, the apex just the some of the most inspiring private revelation that has ever been written in the in the history of the world and i think in that context it's wow this is incredible this is life-changing and you know in the first four volumes just going through a lot of the you know traditional journey of, of the spiritual life of um that has been 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 absolutely incredible and you know for somebody who's coming into this topic new um what what advice would you have to you know how, how because this is a huge topic there's 36 volumes like 7,000 
you know, 7,000 pages long, quite inaccessible topic. Um, what's a good way to get, you know, apart from your books as well, uh, you've also got the 24 seven YouTube channel too of, of uh, teaching the divine will missionaries to what's a good way to sort of an entry point into this topic for anyone who's just like, oh, that looks interesting. Maybe as God is calling me to, to find out more or to study more. There's no shortcuts really, but, but how do you get into this topic? Yeah, well, the get, you get into it by, first of all, before you do anything else, asking, <laughs> asking for the gift of living in the divine will, because Jesus wants to give it more than you want to receive it. And if you're willing to give up your own self-will, and, and this doesn't dispense from anything you're already doing as a Catholic, striving after sanctity, you keep doing all that. Uh, that that's why this builds. This doesn't replace. You give up your will. You, you ask Jesus for his will. And you just, the key is, is, is actually persistence, faithfulness and attentiveness and perseverance and just never forgetting to constantly strive to constantly ask god for his will but in terms of diving in to the the revelations themselves um make sure you're grounded in catholic orthodoxy of course we don't have the official church approved critical footnoted edition uh, of uh, translation of her writings so th there's some errors in translation in every edition that's out there so you just and that's really not the biggest deal if you just remember that you're above all, first and foremost, until the end of time, a Catholic. And uh, you read everything through the lens of public revelation. You stay grounded in your Bible, in your catechism. But as long as you're doing that, dive in. That you can dive in with, Robert mentioned, I've got a, and YouTube has been giving me some problems recently. They keep cutting off the stream. But I try to have a stream going 24-7 right from my house here. I have a set up, a server set up just to continually stream a computer generated audiobook of Jesus's revelations to Louisa. So anytime you don't know what to do with yourself, which is probably all the time these days, just turn it on and listen. You can also just read uh, the, the best way I suppose is to read from volume one onwards, which, you know, it's that the order is intentional. You've got the foundations of the spiritual life in the earlier volumes, and then it gets deeper and deeper into the divine will spirituality, but you don't have to only do that. Um, you know, we don't do that for the Bible. We don't only read it from Genesis to Revelation in perfect order. The script, church, uh, the, the readings at Mass, they jump all over the place, and that's okay. You can jump around if you want to. Um, but but do have the, just remember that the deeper truths do not dispense from the ordinary truths of the spiritual life. If you keep that in mind, you can uh, open up randomly. I've got a PDF of all of Jesus's revelations to Louisa on my site, uh, dsdoconnor.com. You can dive into Francis Hogan's teachings in the divine will. Robert's got a, a website, divinewillfamily.com, or is it dot org? Dog, yeah. dot, dot org. And uh, Francis Hogan has amazing teachings in the divine will. You can look at Father Joseph Anuzzi's teachings. You can follow the newsletters of the Benedictine, Benedictines of the divine will, which is an approved religious order explicitly dedicated to these revelations. So you've got a lot of options here. And the key is just, uh, just do it. Um, you will find that these writings, these revelations will be the missing key to your spiritual life. I can't tell you how many people over the years have emailed me saying, Jesus's words to Louisa were what I've always been waiting for. I didn't even know that I was waiting for something, but this is it. This has changed my whole spiritual life, not, not even just spiritual. This has changed my whole life, period. His were, it, it's, it, it's like, eating food or <laughs> heavenly food, reading these revelations. And I still, I've, I'm well acquainted with these, read them all, I've been studying it for 10 years, and I still find myself short of breath sometimes reading Jesus's words to Louisa. That's how amazing they are, even after having, even, even after I'm rereading them for the 10th time. So just, you know, dive in however you want to, and um, you'll be, you won't be disappointed. And, and Daniel, did you have a, a sort of aha moment? How did you find out about this topic? And have you always been a Catholic? And, and how has your faith journey been kind of from 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 early days? Was there a sort of a, a, a moment for you which which really just was an aha moment? Um, or was it more gradual or progressive? For Luisa's revelations, it was yeah. completely sudden and providential. And, and my I've always been a Catholic, I'm a cradle Catholic, but I was not a good Catholic. No, I'm still not a good Catholic. I'm still trying to. <laughs> but I was uh, mired in mortal sin, like most teenagers today for early years of my life, and um, just had a radical conversion in college, not a conversion of faith, because I was always a believer in, in the faith, but a moral conversion, realized I had to stop sinning that moment, vowed uh, to change my life radically from that day forward. And, and then 
from that point, I grew deeper and deeper into um, uh, Eucharistic adoration. I was blessed to live a block away from an uh, adoration chapel in college. So I started going there every day. I started going to mass every day. Somebody put up a sign on the bulletin board going into mass about praying outside of Planned Parenthood. So I started doing that all the time also. Thank you, uh, Robert. And then that uh, those works of mercy, that's one of the most powerful works of mercy you can do is, is uh, pro-life efforts. And um, all that drew me deeper and deeper and wanting to find the key to sanctity, which I realize is all that matters. Sanctity is all that matters. There's all the great the quote is still the bottom of my email. It's been this way for many years. Everybody I email sees it. There is only one tragedy, ultimately, not to have become a saint. It's the only tragedy. It's not to be a saint. And living in the divine will, by the way, is the greatest way to become a saint. But uh, what stands out in my, and before I had any notion of Louisa, what always stood out in my mind as the key was St. Alphonsus's, St. Alphonsus Liguori's teachings on uniformity with the divine will. I don't know how I stumbled upon that, but of all the reading, all the things I read in those days of trying to dive deeper and deeper into the faith, that always just stuck with me as I can, I can see that this is the key. And it is fitting, providential, because that's the perfect introduction to Louisa, St. Alphonsus Liguori's Uniformity of the Divine Will, because he said the key to sanctity, it's simple and it's, quote, easy in one sense, hard in another sense, but is not so much just obeying God. That's of course necessary that's but he said that's conformity with the divine will he said uniformity with the divine will is even more uniformity with the divine will is emerging of it's a perfect sharing of life it is that you don't want to have your own you don't want to give your own will life anymore you just want to have the divine will reigning over you and that was a huge development in catholic spirituality because before him Many writers, including Aquinas, who I, I'm a Thomist, but I love Aquinas. But he, yeah, he's he's got a few things that were in need of of clarification and development. Even Aquinas said, "No, our, our union of uh, the in, divine will in the human will, the relation between those two is limited to mere imitation. All we're, we're all we can do is try to imitate the divine will." The writers after him said, "No, it's about more than that. It's about union of wills." And that developed, this is just all part of the Holy Spirit working in the church, building and building and building towards something. And that's something we now know is living in the divine will. That's and, right. And we've got the imitation of Christ to Kempis mm -hmm. and, you know, to Cossord, surrender to divine yes. providence. So this really goes in uniformity with all that. And then the Holy Spirit teaching in the New Testament, it's really in uniformity with, with that as as, as a natural development and and tell us a, a few about, about your some of your other interests as well um and also how the spirituality has affected your life personally of um how you've grown spiritually as, as you know you've, you've come across these teachings um you know some of the other interests engineering philosophy blogging the divine will missionaries of mercy these kind of other, other topics and you know uh, god has yeah. blessed your life you know through through this teaching that you know it's led to a development of a development of, of spiritual and personal life too. Yeah, I got a lot of things going on, don't I? I got <laughs> busy man. <laughs> I have a tendency to bite off more than I can chew, but um, but I'm still interested in all of it. Yeah, so I've got I've had my blog for I don't know 12 years now, and um, I try I, I only have a blog, no social media because I don't want to be tempted to um just constantly post every stupid little thought that comes to my mind. <laughs> um, and I'm not, I'm, I know many people use social media for good. I'm not criticizing you if, you if you have one. It's just, for me, I need to not have that temptation. So I just have a blog and I try to only post when I have something important to say. My blog is dsdoconnor.com. Um, and then, uh, so that's always in the background. But then there's also, as you said, the uh, Divine Will Missionaries of Mercy, which I started it wasn't called the Divine Will Missionaries of Mercy when I started it in um, 2014, I believe it was. I called it the City Missionaries of Divine Mercy. So there's no divine will in there. And my goal was just to go walk through the cities and pray. That's all I wanted to do. And it was good back when I was doing that. But there was something missing. And um, it, it grew on me more and more that I needed to kind of incorporate the divine will into this apostolate. And you might not know what I'm talking about yet with the apostle, but just I'll, I'll get more into it in a moment. So I, I, I prayed for a spiritual director and I was miraculously sent what it was amazing. Like it couldn't have been more providential, the spiritual director who I was sent in response to prayer. It was clearly God's will that I asked him. And, and he was, um, 
I, I brought this question to him. Should I incorporate the divine will revelations of Jesus to Louisa into this apostolate? And I wasn't expecting a yes, and I won't go into the details of why, but he said, absolutely. You need, this needs to be about the divine will and the divine mercy. And as soon as I transformed this apostolate to be the divine will missionaries of mercy, and I kind of modified it a bit to have our goal be to go to mass, beg God for the gift of living in the divine will and for the preservation of the Eucharist miraculously within us and then to just go out onto the streets not expecting anything not with any particular plan but just to pray just to walk and pray the divine mercy chaplet and the rosary and this whatever happens happens but all of a sudden all sorts of more things started to happen then and i think that it was all about the gift of living in the divine will jesus says that with this gift you can be truly a living host not um not that your substance is replaced, like, like in the host itself, you're still a person, but that his real life can be created in you spiritually through the gift of living in the divine will. And you can receive the, lift, the gift of living in the divine will anytime, but I know I'm a miserable sinner, and I know that I am most likely to be open to that grace when I have our Lord himself truly sacramentally within me. And before I've gotten back into my day's activities and I'm thinking about all these things and I'm getting angry at coworkers and things. And, but I think that we are most likely to be truly living in the divine will at mass and after mass before we let all the distractions of our life enter into our minds. So what, I, what my goal is with this apostolate, Divine Will Missionaries of Mercy, is to just beg as many people as possible to go to mass as often as you can, every day if you can. And with the Eucharist within you, after you receive, to ask God for the gift of living in the divine will, and then remain recollected after Mass, instead of just gabbing about sports or something with whoever else was there, remain recollected and try to go out into the world and hold on to those graces as long as you can, bring them out into the world, pray and evangelize with whatever opportunities the Holy Spirit presents to you. That's... Um, that I, I do it by I, as much as I can, at least I walk through the, I actually walk through the streets of the city after mass. Most people won't be able to do that. That's okay. But you try to be a Eucharistic procession into the world after mass on your commute, at work, uh, at, at school, on your errands, whatever. But Benedict the 16th, uh, one of my patroness, the, the patroness for this apostolate, Our Lady, the visitation, I chose her because Pope Benedict the 16th taught that the visitation was the first Eucharistic procession because our Lord was physically truly inside our lady. But guess when our Lord is also truly physically inside us when we receive the Eucharist. So we ourselves need to become Eucharistic processions into the world. And we can do that, especially with the gift of living in the divine will. That's right. And we're called to be Eucharistic hosts and um, you know, uh, that we, we are sent forth, you know, eat a miss or us. We are, we're sent forth at the end of, of mass to go, to go into the world and you know uh, daniel how how has god blessed you in your life um since you've you know discovered this teaching and uh and then implemented it in your your own life that god has uh, you you experienced spiritual growth but but how has it affected you personally yeah I, you know i forgot that so that's that's what you asked earlier that i was forgetting about the, this particular spirituality when was i introduced to this so i was um I was working as a live-in house father, big brother in this transitional home for homeless young men a decade or so ago. And I was thought I was just going to mass as I did every day. It was just an ordinary mass I thought I was going to. And it wound up being a, a, a retreat on this mystic I'd never heard of, Luis Picaretta, given by this priest, Father Joseph Iannuzzi. So I decided, all right, I'll stay for this retreat. Didn't, don't know what's going on here. I don't know what this is, but I've got time, so I might as well stay. There was mass after my work day that day in the evening. And I um, was just utterly blown away by Jesus's words to Louisa. And I just knew right away this was it. And I dove in as zealously as I could. Not long after that, the same year, 2011, I went on, I went on this big road trip across the country on a Greyhound bus. Just, it was crazy. It was all over the place. But I had a a MB3 player, and I was listening to an audiobook of Luis's Revelations, basically what I have going through Divine Will 24-7 constantly. Um, that made the, the single biggest fruit, I think. The single, first of all, everything seems to kind of just suddenly work and fit with when you're diving into these revelations. I, I just, I can't deny that. Even, even job-wise, just 
not just spiritually, but everything. It, it suddenly, suddenly seems to work according to God's will and successfully, not in the, necessarily in a worldly sense, but beautifully and perfectly after you start diving into these revelations, it's almost weird considering how many people have told me that that's happened in their own lives. But that's not as important as the spiritual aspect, of course. And the single biggest fruit, I think, is just absolutely invincible peace. Nothing can disturb you when you realize that God's will is supreme, that he freely desires to give his will to you, that all you need to do is give him your will, desire his own will, ask for his will, and that this gift is given to you, which contains everything you could possibly legitimately want. Within the gift of living in the divine will is everything you could possibly legitimately want. There's not a yacht and a sport car in it, but why would you want that anyway? <laughs> there's perfect peace. There's deliverance from purgatory. There's absolute happiness. There's total trust. There's the power to evangelize. There, there, there's, there's forgiveness of your sins. There, there's this power to pray and act and, and do all of your acts in the divine will and to be perfectly at peace in the midst of everything you do. It's all within this gift and the peace and the joy that comes with knowing that and not just knowing it, but feeling the truth of it inside of you. It's, it's, it's the peace that surpasses all understanding that scripture speaks of. And it is yours for the asking if you desire this gift of living in the divine will. That's phenomenal. And, you know, I think for people who might not have heard of this topic before, you know, You've mentioned Father Ian Newsy, Francis Hogan. Um, there's, you know, the, the two books that you've written, the YouTube, uh, YouTube 24 seven, which is on your website as well. And, you know, um, what would you say? Some people say, you know, what about concupiscence? You know, does this not undermine the sort of church's teaching on concupiscence or something? Um, you know, it's a very deep, um, deep understanding of spirituality, but, but how would you answer that question? And, um, I've, you know, I've been asked that by, by somebody that wasn't able to give a, a really solid answer. What would you say to that question? Well, there's many, you know, I focus on the essence of, I'm just constantly begging people to desire this gift and ask for it. But admittedly, it is more complicated than that once you really start to grow in the divine will. There's, there's, there's levels of the divine will. There's, Jesus tells Luis about different choirs in the divine will. There's the very center of the divine will, and then there's the divine will on loan. The important thing is just to dive in. You, you, the, but it's also true that most people will probably go in and out of the divine will, yeah. that people will have various degrees within the divine will. You know, it, this is a whole new realm. It's not a single specific, it's not like a little outfit you put on. It's a whole new life. And within this whole new life, there's, there's just as many variations as there were outside of it, if not more. You know, heaven... Everyone lives in the divine will in heaven, but in heaven, there's a huge hierarchy. There's all sorts of, heaven is not communism. You know, we're not all just exactly the same. <laughs> well, we'll all be perfectly happy in heaven, but the, the, um, the breadth of that happiness will be different depending upon what we did on earth. So the same thing with living in the divine will. When you really enter into the center of the divine will and you're anchored in it, then this sanctity is so deep that you will actually start to lose even your uh, inclination to sin. And this is, is not, it's not actually as radical as it might sound. There in, in um, the teachings of St. John of the Cross, I believe, and maybe it's Teresa of Avila, maybe both, now I'm forgetting. I think they also teach that at the deepest levels of mystical marriage, um, which is actually not as high as living in the divine will, that's the step before it, uh, you, your passions themselves no longer suffer from concupiscence. So it's true that concupiscence is a result of original sin, but it's not necessarily a permanent result. Um, you, it can, you can actually get rid of it. Now, that doesn't mean that living in the divine will is absolute ontological confirmation and grace. It's not. As long as we're on earth, uh, as long as we don't have the beatific vision, sin remains possible. And that'll be true in the era also. But there comes a point where sin is so unlikely that you don't have any draw to it anymore and you don't fear you don't you're not wondering anymore if it's going to happen um the uh and so during the era and the era by the way the important part about the era is the spiritual gift which you have access to right now but this gift in the um in the depths when you have this gift in its fullness when you're anchored in the center of living in the divine will right now you might be very tempted to say 
gossip or, or eat too much ice cream when it when it's out. Uh, but maybe hopefully most people watching this, hopefully you don't have any temptation to um, go rob a bank or murder someone you're annoyed at. Like <laughs> you're not even worried that you're going to do that because it's so far beyond what you'd ever, it's so wrong and it's so far beyond what you'd ever consider that you just don't have the slightest fear that that's going to happen. You kind of know it's not. Um, all sin will become like that when you're truly anchored in the center of the gift of living in the divine will. You won't have the slightest inclination toward it. Yeah, it's not, you know, intentional sin, like, you know, the more you get into this, it's going to be less and less likely. And I think that's a great answer for the concupiscence question, too. And, you know, Louisa had four mystical marriages in the the early volumes as well. And uh, for me personally, just realizing the depth of the spiritual life that is that is there and, you know, um, just the interior life that we can have with Christ, you know, so many Catholics, you know, might not realize that the real depth of relationship that we can have with God, you know, all of me and all of you all the time, you know, and if we enter into our own nothingness, then, you know, God can flood our own interior life and transform our life completely. And this isn't, you know, um, and what would you say to somebody, you know, who's quite confused about private revelation and public revelation, thinking that this is something new or, or additional? I mean, I think you go into real detail with um, the crown of sanctity uh, of just how this is a continuation of the teaching of the church and it's building upon what everyone else is saying um, rather than being something kind of heretical or, you know, people worried about sort of mysticism of, of something that doesn't have the stamp of approval, what, what have you. What, what is a way to sort of get through those kind of reservations that people might have to to really enter into the bask in the glory of the, this teaching in, in its fullness. Well, you said it so well that this greatest sanctity, God wants to give it to us more than we want to receive it. Faustina, and I'll paraphrase here because I don't have it in front of me, but she said something to the effect of the greatest sanctity possible is easy. All that's needed is a bit of goodwill. But we have, we're tempted, this is straight from the pit of hell, this is the devil, we are tempted to have this false humility that says, oh, no, no, great sanctity, that's, yeah, right, that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm not holy, and yeah, you're probably not holy, but you're not creating the sanctity in you, God is, we're not Pelagian, we're not quietists, and we're not Pelagians, those are opposite errors, we, you know, the Pelagians think that everything we do is, uh, uh, the it that is our works. own moral effort that creates virtue and sanctity within us. Yeah. The quiet to say, no, the, the will doesn't need to do anything at all. It just needs to be completely passive and, and not act. Jesus isn't saying either of those to Louisa. He's saying this sanctity will be my work completely, but your will is going to be active. This is not, your will is not, it's not just a matter of not, um, not acting, not, not, it's about acting as actively as ever, but with the divine will animating your action instead of the self-will and the self the, in your own inclinations and wants and desires animating your action. So this, um, th this is not at all in contradiction to the teaching of the church. It's, it's perfectly orthodox. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the orthodoxy is so perfect that it's yet another proof that this could not be of human origin. Like, look, I, let me admit, I, I, can, I can be persnickety. I can find a contradiction in just about anything. <laughs> I cannot find any in Luis's revelations. It, it, I can't. In fact, the, 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 or the perfection of, and this, you can look at the authority also, that the church has said this, all the theologians that the church has commissioned to analyze these revelations have not come up with any contradictions of Catholic faith morals. So at the end of the day, who, these critics, these detractors of Louisa, who are you to contradict what the church is saying? The church has proclaimed her a servant of God. The church has given her, her volumes imprimaturs. And, it, and this isn't just any old imprimatur. These were dozens of imprimaturs back in the early 1900s when they were much harder to get, given by a canonized saint, St. Hannibal, who dedicated his life to promoting a revelation. So at the end of the day, the, the best answer to that is to be a little humble and realize that we don't have it figured out. The church uh, whose mission is to do the, whose man, whose divine mandate is to do this, has done it for us and has affirmed this. Yes, it's, it's still got approvals to go, but we've got nothing to worry about even where it already is. But, uh, you know, the questions are also worth considering on their own as well. A, if some new private revelation were to come along and say, oh, guess what? There's actually four persons in God, not three. <laughs> that would be a contradiction 
of public revelation because public revelation doesn't say, okay, there's at least three gods. There's, sorry, there's at least three persons in God. Public revelation says there's exactly three persons in God. To say that there are four persons in God or five persons in God, that is a contradiction. That's not a development. That's not, a, that's not an organic uh, growing deeper and deeper into public revelation as Luis's do for us. That's a contradiction of public revelation. That's as that would be, as the catechism says, claiming to surpass or correct public revelation. That's not acceptable. But as long as we are operating within the boundaries given to us by public revelation, there is no reason to arbitrarily put a ceiling up and say, nope, private revelation, you can't go, you can't get any more glorious than this. You can't make any promises more, more glorious than this. You got to stop there. It's exactly what happened with St. Faustina. The promises in the divine mercy revelations are astounding. Uh, receiving communion on divine mercy sunday guess what that is it's a second baptism there's no it's it, that's it's truly that's maybe not as slight modifications for the sake of orthodoxy yes but pragmatically that's exactly what it is that was too much for a lot of pharisees in the church to bear it didn't contradict any dogmas it didn't contradict public revelation at all it was but it, it was well beyond anything that had ever been promised before. The divine mercy image, Jesus telling uh, St. Faustina, whosoever venerates this image shall not perish. That was too much for the Pharisees in the church. You know, if you, if you so St. Faustina was condemned, which many of people watching this probably already know. But if you look into that, you know, the, the ordinary voices will say, oh, it was just because of a mistranslation. No, it wasn't. It was because there are Pharisees in the church, there were then and there are now, who can't handle uh, God doing more than they expect. Well, I mean, I, I'm struck by the humility of God and just, yeah, I mean, just look, you know, the incarnation story, you know, being a, born in a stable in Bethlehem and then, you know, who would think it like a sort of mystic, a bedridden, you know, Italian saint to be, you know, one of the most incredible, in, you know, incredible spiritual lives in the history of the church. Who, who would have thought that? And, you know, this, the mystical experience that she had, you know, living on the Eucharist alone, like Martha Robbiar and look at the journey of St. Faustina, of, you know, how her story, which took decades to be approved by the church, um, even, you know, uh, some of the, the, just how some of the mystics have lived in the church in terms of, you know, their message might not have been approved straight away, they've had to wait decades, and God works in, God works in mysterious ways, and you know, not in the ways that we imagine. And I think that's that's what's so beautiful about these teachings, that Jesus suffered the passion interiorly. Um, the hours of the passion that, that Louisa wrote, just absolutely extraordinary. And, you know, um, it, this is really, wow, it's something that is transforming for our own spiritual lives. And I think that's why Louisa, under obedience, wrote down, well, you know, I don't think she wanted to, to write down everything all, all, all the time, but, you know, was obedient to the priests, um, follow, followed their teaching and you know she was asked to write down because they know wow the, the priest knew the depth of the the spiritual communion that she had with god um four mystical marriages absolutely incredible just in the context of like 2020 and 2021 you know where we are in in the world at the moment with all with all the craziness going on of you know lockdowns and lockdowns and and, and, and travel you know how do you see this teaching in context um with you know the the contemporary world as 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 we stand as 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 crazy as the world is right now in 2021 how do you put this sort of teaching in in context and you know in the context of salvation history as well yeah it's i i'm glad you brought up that what you had just said because the um god's timing is always perfect and when we look at things superficially it's easy to lament and moan and groan and that's certainly what I'm tempted to do when I look at how long so many in the church have neglected these writings. But I also realize that God, in his permissive will, he didn't want that neglect specifically, but his permissive will was all part of his permissive will. And he, this, these revelations, as we speak, something is happening. They are starting to explode throughout the world. They've been, they've existed for decades and decades, but they are starting to explode throughout the world. And I know that that is because now is the time. And what that, that's why we can have such great hope, because we can look out in the world, we can have great hope because of Bill Gates and Joe Biden and the Chinese Communist Party and heretical priests and apostate bishops. They all give me gr such great hope. 
Do you know why? <laughs> they, they do. <laughs> because Jesus tells Louisa that evil must exhaust itself before he renews the church and the world. And if the last year has taught us anything, it's that evil is doing precisely that before our eyes. <laughs> to clarify, in case anyone thought that any of those things I just listed themselves give me hope. No, the point is evil is overtaking the world and the church. I don't need to, I, don't, I hope I don't need to convince too many people of that anymore. It's too obvious now. That is the surest, it's one of the sure signs that the renewal is getting closer because we already know beforehand that evil has to completely exhaust itself. It has to just inundate. And when that has happened, the chastisements will come and they will purify the earth for the reign of the divine will and fulfillment of the Our Father by the era of peace promised by more prophecies and popes and private revelations than I can count. And we know with absolute mathematical certainty that it is coming, but we don't know exactly when. When it comes depends upon our proclamation of these truths, because the, the coming of the kingdom, it needs to be given to those who want it. Jesus says that constantly to Louisa. I, 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 you have no idea, he says to her, how much I want to give this kingdom. But I need, I want to give it to those who themselves want it and ask for it. But how can they want it and ask for it if they have no idea what the plan even is? So that's why it's the most important mission in history for us to proclaim this, to get as many people as possible knowing about this so that they can desire it, so that they can want it and ask for it, so that they can pray the, fun, the primary central petition of the Our Father with more passion and zeal than ever before. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, uh, you're absolutely right. And where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And, you know, the era of peace, uh, Fatima, that's a you know, proved teaching of the church. And we don't know when this time will be. But I, th I think, you know, in this uh, in this talk we've had together, you really articulated, you know, just a, a great way to get into this teaching to encourage encourage listeners. This is absolutely incredible topic. The gift of living in the divine will, Louise Bicaretis. Go study as much as you can on this topic, um, and embrace the spirituality. And there are incredible graces, incredible blessings. Just as a last kind of question, um, Daniel, you know, uh, what would you say to a, a Catholic who really wants to deepen their faith? You mentioned all the crisis we've gone at the moment, um, all the challenges we have. You know, what's a great way just to get, get into sort of some of this private revelation to deepen faith? What are some great ways to do that? I know the, the lockdown really got rid of a lot of distractions for me and and helped really clarify in in my life just um, how deep it is possible to go to have a, a much closer relationship with God. And what would you say to somebody who really desires that, really wants that? Um, what can we say to that person who really wants to have a closer interior life with God? looking for that and maybe is, is kind of missing that at the moment well i would in addition to those things what we've talked about with diving into Luis's revelations that as i said in the beginning of our of our talk that doesn't dispense us from doing anything that we're already doing as catholics and the most powerful things in developing our faith growing closer to our lord i think our uh, the eucharist receiving our lord in the eucharist as often as possible and I know a lot of people hearing this, it's not even possible at all. So I'm not, you know, what God understands our circumstances, whatever you can do, whatever you can't do, you can't do. But as all, I know daily mass has been the greatest grace of my life. And then spending those moments after mass, when most people are just gabbing away or running out of church, the second, the final blessing, spending those moments instead in fervent prayer and meditation and, in, and can you just talking to our Lord? developing your relationship with him when you already know he is physically, literally, sacramentally within you, taking full advantage of those moments and also praying the rosary every day. As so many private revelations have said, not just pray the rosary, but pray it every single day. And if you have a family, I know it's not easy that, that kids will be probably be going wild, but that's okay, just do it. The, it's okay if, it's, if the kids are going wild while you pray. It's pray the rosary every day, the divine mercy chaplet, read scripture, fast, and just keep trying. You're going to fail all the time. I know I do, but just keep trying. Perseverance, maybe that's even the primary virtue for these days of increasing darkness. Never give up and you will succeed by God's grace. 
Hey, Daniel, well, it's been absolutely privileged speaking with you today. Thank you so much for um, um, thank you so much for this interview, and thank you for writing those two incredible books. Um, really encourage you to just go to go to Amazon or go to your local uh, local bookstore or uh, wherever you go. It's the Crown of History and the Crown of Sanctity. Uh, they're absolutely incredible books. Um, thank you for what you are doing to promote the divine will, and may, may God bless your family and. Uh, Look forward to continuing to live in the divine world. God bless you, Daniel, and thank you so much for this interview today. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me. Great stuff.